Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, sorry. Uh, now is the time for one of the hot topics, not only in the EU, EU, but across the world. And we will address it from the regulator's point of view and from the industry point of view. As you know, the European response to the challenges posed by digital platforms are two key pieces of legislation, the Digital Market Act and the Digital Service Act. We have today an impressive panel to discuss about both of them. To launch the debate, I will ask our speakers to focus on three strategic issues. What, from their perspectives, is the principal added value of DMA and DSA for the digital markets in Europe? What, the second, second question would be, what could be the impact of these regulations at a national level. And third, uh, and that, uh, last, lastly, what in the view, what could be improved in the Commission's proposal? So we will start with my colleagues, Anne-Marie and Benoit, from, uh, from the regulator's perspective, to gain this regulator perspective. Anne-Marie Spikes is director, director for telecoms, telecommunication, transport, and postal services. Netherlands Authority for Consumers and Market, ACM. And incoming chair, Berek, uh, and incoming Berek chair 2022. Please, Samari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandra. And thank you very much for this, uh, uh, for announcing me. Um, and congratulations. I mean, I'm so happy that the IIC and Berek uh, have this joint event once again, I think it is very timely, and I think the, the agenda shows that we almost have too many issues to discuss between European regulators on the one hand and uh, industry on the other. Um, so thank you very much for having me on this uh, on this panel, and I'm looking forward to exchanging and deepening our insights with my with my fellow panelists. Uh, maybe um, uh, just to start, I think it is very clear, looking at the past year, how important the digital world is to all of us. How, especially in the last year, we have been able to reap the fruits of the digital platforms. Uh, we have been working through digital means. We have been reaching out to friends, to colleagues, to families. We have went to school. We have had our only entertainment through uh, in our leisure time uh, very often through digital means. So we are all, I think, very much in agreement that there are so many benefits of the huge developments that we have seen in the digital world. Um, and the digital economy um, has so many um, opportunities and presented so many chances to both households, to consumers, to citizens of Europe and to businesses as well. Um, but also, if you study what is going on, and if you're um, catching up with all that is happening, and um, uh, you do see that there are also risks involved. And uh, I think that awareness has grown in Europe over the past years. And in that respect, I think um, I'm very proud to, on behalf of Beric, share our thoughts on the DMA. And I think our overwhelming um, uh, stance is, of course, that it is very timely that the European uh, Commission and the European Parliament uh, are both working very hard um, to add this new piece of legislation to the toolbox to make sure that we have a proper legal framework um, to add to um, open and uh, open and transparent digital markets to make sure that we all can still uh, profit from all the advantages while tempering the risks. So what is, I think, you asked two, two, three questions, uh, Alejandra. I think the first added value, uh, and one thing that we strongly um, underline and agree with with the Commission uh, from the perspective of Beric, is that this is, the DMA is an asymmetric uh, instrument. We, it is not intended to regulate the internet, because that would kill all innovation, that would take away its advantages. It is specifically targeted to certain practices by certain large gatekeepers. So the asymmetric character of the regulation is, I think, 
a very strong point that we strongly support. And um, I'll give you a few examples of what that uh, brings us and where, uh, where we see that the DMA really makes a difference for the better. Two examples from end user perspective. The first one um, is that uh, the DMA gives end users, again, uh, better ownership of their personal data because it, it tells large gatekeepers, it restricts them in their practices to gather personal data, combine it and use them without the consent, the specific consent of those users. So because it prohibits gatekeepers to just use the data for whatever they please, it explicitly demands that they ask for permission from the end user that, uh, that his or her data are used for a specific purpose. I think that giving back ownership of that data to an end user is very welcome. Uh, to all people in Europe. The second example is it makes it more open. It gives uh, end users the right to install or uninstall software applications um, that you choose. So if you do use a platform service, you are not, you cannot be obliged to use all the applications, but you do have the right to install or uninstall software applications as long as it's technically feasible. So that gives more choice to end users. And this blocks what I would call the Hotel California clause. You enter a platform and you can never leave. And so it opens up um, and makes sure that end users can benefit better from all the advantages throughout uh, the digital economy and not having one um, choice define all other choices and take them away. So that's from an end user perspective. But of course, the digital platforms also help on the business side. And here, I think also small and medium sized enterprises benefit from DMA. And the DMA will help making um, sure that innovation and openness are uh, guaranteed within the platform economy. And two examples are one, it ends the practice, it, it enables, it gives SMEs the right to interact with end users that they have acquired on a certain platform, but it gives them the right to interact with them subsequently on a different platform or in a different way more directly. So again, here also SMEs are given the choice. You can reach out to a consumer on a platform, but if you want to make it an extra offer or you want it to take a contract outside of that platform, that is a right that you have, and at the platform, the, the large gatekeeper cannot block you from. And I think that opens up uh, the economy, the digital economy, and makes it more open to uh, innovation. And it also contributes to the level playing field where it explicitly prohibits large gatekeepers from, pro from refraining from keeping the possibility from SMEs to um, file complaints with um, the relevant authorities should they um, wish to. So here again, given the um, level of uh, the, the difference between the really large gatekeepers that the DMA is targeting and the SMEs throughout the European Union, it levels the playing field um, if they counter any problems. So I think in this respect, the asymmetric character of the DMA targeting adverse uh, behavior from large gatekeepers is, is really uh, adding to the way in which we in Europe try to get a legal framework to make sure that we can all profit from an open, transparent, and innovative digital platform. So that was an answer to your first question, Alejandra, on the uh, added advantages that we from Barrick see in the DMA. Of course, in Barrick, we are a federation of, uh, of NRAs, and we're trying to, um, and so we also look at it from our national uh, experience. And then your second question was, what are the implications of the DMA for a national level? And I think these implications, um, of course, the DMA targets the large gatekeepers who are active on a European scale. Uh, this is the first thing, um, and rightfully so, as I already said, this is one of the key components that we um, that we strongly support. But um, in addition to that, regulation is all, can only be efficient and can only be effective if it's rooted, if it's thoroughly evidence-based, and it is rooted in the experience of both end users and uh, businesses alike throughout all uh, the national markets. So here, I think, 
on a national level, what we need to do is we need to gather data. What is happening out there? We need to monitor the markets. How is uh, compliance? What does it look like from the user perspective, both on the business side as well as on consumer and household side? Um, I think it would be wise to have an information and complaints desk, not just in Brussels, where the where the enforcing authority, of course, will rest probably with the European Commission, but also to make it as easily accessible as possible. So to make a national information and complaints desk, as it were, to make sure that that information is channeled directly through Brussels. And the fourth one is um, in, what you see in practice is you have very clear rules, but reality is not just strange and fiction. Reality is, of course, very slippery and changing compared to legislation. So it needs to be put into practice, and we will see probably that end users or businesses will say that will complain that large gatekeepers are not complying with the DMA. And here, I think at Barrick, we see that we have a very uh, thorough uh, experience and good experience with dispute resolution. How does one? Um, evaluate the way that these regulations and these rules uh, and these remedies are put into practice. How does this work in the day-to-day -day dealings that uh, the large gatekeepers on the one hand and we as a meet on the other hand have with each other? And disputes will of course arise, they do all the time. And what one needs is um, a fast mechanism to make sure that there is, uh, that these disputes are resolved and that they are resolved in a swift, transparent, and consistent uh, way across the EU. I personally think that that is, given the pervasiveness of the digital markets, um, I think this is a whole lot of work to put the DMA into practice. So I do think that it would be wise to make sure that at a national, that you, that you get all your information, your data, and all the practices, you get a collection mechanism to make sure that all the information and all that's needed to make the DMA into a success. We do have a national mechanism in place to supplement um, the enforcement that will remain for the investors. So that is, I think, what at a national level um, will be implied that we all have to make sure uh, uh, to help and assist with proper enforcement uh, of the DMA to make sure that we close the feedback loop. Um, and I do think that it was, I think, your, your third question, that the largest risk is that or the, the best way of improvement is to make sure that we make uh, sure that we put, um, for example, in implementation rules, put mechanisms in place to make sure that this is done as transparent and as effective and efficient as possible. So that we do have in Europe um, a transparent um, and swift mechanism to make sure that we can still uh, be assured that we can all profit from the open, uh, innovative uh, data platform economy that we have been enjoying this year so much. I think that is thank you excellent at this point. Alejandro. Thank you very much, and Marie. That was quite interesting. Uh, the, uh, giving us the point of view of that Beric has, has expressed and is working on, and so and answering all, all the questions. Now, I have um, a, a good question to, to pose you, which is uh, regarding uh, at the national uh, level, what elements do you think that um, national independent authority authorities would want to monitor the, um, uh, in order to support the, um, EA, the European uh, authority, which, which are, do you think are these elements that you think that a uh, national independent authority would want? Thank you. I'm so sorry, Alejandra. I think I would have your question. Thank you. Do you, have you, heard, you, sir. Yes. you said on the national experience, and then I am so sorry, my system let me down. Okay, uh, well, I will repeat it, yes. Uh, re regarding what you have said, um, what do you think, what are the elements, the key elements that uh, 
our national independent authorities would want mm -hmm. uh, to monitor in order ah. to support um, the EU authority. Yes. Well, as I, as I said, the DMA, of course, once it is in force, it has to be put into practice. And then, of course, the proof of the pudding is, is, is in the eating, is what will happen in practice. So I think it is very important that national independent authorities keep tabs on what is happening in practice. And the one example that I gave, for example, is, is in dispute resolution, one might, one might add to making sure that a practice is developed that is swift, transparent and consistent throughout the Union. Um, uh, so I think there it, it can... Um, uh, national independent authorities, of course, have... We have several, I think, several mechanisms in place within Europe where you have uh, ways of reaching out to the market, of uh, coming, reaching uh, decisions, and making sure that there is the right interplay between the national specific circumstances on the one hand, and the European uh, legislation and the role of the Commission, and to make sure that there is uh, agreement and consistency across the various markets. Because of course, this will not be effective if we all um, if we have divergent practices, of course. But I do think that we have uh, that the various national independent authorities, Barrett being one of them, have extensive experience in making sure that we, on the one hand, uh, take into account the national specificities because different businesses differ, markets differ on the one hand, but also the fact that we want one European context and one European regulation put into place. So I think in, for example, the way that we do dispute resolution within BEREC and make sure that within a very short period of time, a couple of months, we both reach a decision as well as make sure that it is in full alignment with the European, uh, with the European practice, uh, that is guaranteed, um, that that could uh, could really help in uh, in strengthening the implementation. Of the Great, that's good, and um, I completely agree with you. And so now it's time to to to, to have another point of view uh, from the the, the as a media regulator on the other uh, draft regulation, which is the DSA. And so uh, I will, uh, we will come to you and Marie, thank you very much when, when we have all, all joined together, all the, all the group. And now, is it, as I said, uh, it's time to discuss on the DSA, which is the other, the other uh, regulation that is, uh, is being uh, analyzed in this, uh, in the, in the, and we are going to talk with uh, uh, Benoit Nutrel, who is a member of the board of the CSA. Good afternoon, Benoit. Hello, good afternoon, Alejandra. How are you? Good. Good, thank Benoit. you. I'll give you the floor to and, and to share with you which are the views on these three three main questions that I have uh, posed to you, and to of course to discuss with you which are the main uh, key elements that for the DSA poses to. Uh, media authorities uh, that you represent as member of the board of the CSA. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alejandra. Well, I, I guess uh, I should say bluntly that uh, DSA is really a major improvement, and we are really happy that uh, this major initiative that, that was launched by the Commission. Uh, the DSA clearly is a way to fix the, the weak points that we had in the e-commerce directive with this limited liability of platforms. And as we all know, platforms hold power. Some platforms hold very large power. And the, the greater the power you have, the greater your accountability should be, the greater your responsibility, your social responsibility should be. Uh, so the question really uh, that we are trying to address with the DSA with this proposal from the Commission, is how you, do you develop uh, the responsibility, how do you develop the accountability of players operating at scale? And the new element here is really that we have players which operate at scale. And uh, how do you define new standards for what I would call uh, an algorithmic responsibility, an algorithmic res accountability? So I guess uh, the aim is the same, but it's... Uh, uh, completely different from what you were used to implement through editorial responsibility. Uh, when you have to think of editorial as uh, media, TV, radio, 
those media operate uh, on a granular basis. They take one content after the other. And when you try to establish, enhance a responsibility to make sure they participate in a, uh, achieving public uh, objective, uh, you, you, you regulate on a regular, on a granular basis. Here, clearly, we have to invent new way to regulate because when you operate a platform, you operate at scale. So it's a, it's a very nice challenge. How do you regulate those platforms, make them more responsible, more accountable, without preventing them from operating at scale? Uh, and in the DSA, we have new key ingredients, uh, clearly, which are this duty of care and the transparency requirements. Uh, both. Uh, are new and are not new, I guess. They are not new in the sense that, of course, platform try to take care of their customers, of their, of the, of the members of the platform, and they try to be transparent. But for the time being, they have been operating on a self-regulation -regulat uh, basis. And experience have proven us that uh, this has very low credibility and we cannot rely anymore uh, on self-regulation. And the DSA is about how do you establish a legally enforced standard, a legally enforced duty of care, a legally enforced uh, transparency requirement. And this will make a major difference because uh, the DSA will bring the governance, will, which will give credibility to this, this transparency requirement and which will allow to have everybody participate in the regulation of this platform because suddenly we'll have the capacity to put faith in what they are telling us and to have a much stronger debate, public policy debate on those issues. Uh, this approach is de facto built on what we have been starting to build, uh, to develop in the AVMS directive. It goes one step further. Um, it's more open, it's more adapted, I guess, uh, to the new type of platform we are having, uh, where at the heart of it, you have uh, user-generated content, and you have key elements, of course, which are very important for us, media regulator, uh, of um, values uh, of uh, uh, de defending the freedoms that we have in Europe, which really needs to have very specific care to protect them. So we, we think uh, is, this will be a very interesting adventure and we are eager to participate in it. Uh, interesting thing is how you, uh, the DSA or the digital revolution, because I don't know, I guess spec it come from initially from the digital revolution we are facing, creates new dynamics and it will have new dynamics, including for regulators. How do you operate on a national basis, but with players which are more global by nature, or even if they are initially local, they have the, they all are dreaming of becoming global. So I think it's created a new dynamic and we are seeing that uh, in the governance uh, feature, which are proposed by the commission in the first draft of the DSA, is how do you change the way regu regulators operate, both at the same time as localized institutional capacities in each member state, because you need to be localized. You need to have uh, this link with uh, each member state, especially when you deal with content, with, where you have some element of culture, of, uh, of history. And uh, at the same time, we are part of, uh, of an EU network. And I heard that ERGA was a federation of uh, regulators. I suspect that, uh, sorry, that BEREC was a federation of regulators. I suspect that ERGA is a network of regulators. And we have to, to, to learn how to work both on national and an AU basis and uh, to act more and more collectively, uh, collectively to define uh, the standard at AU level, which is a way to enshrine the European single market, and also to monitor and to enforce locally uh, because that's where the harm can take place, and that's where we have to deliver uh, values for the EU, EU citizens. This is uh, maybe what can I, uh, I can say at this point to, to introduce the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit. That's quite interesting. Uh, coming from a media re regulator, your perspective is uh, quite good for, for, uh, for all of us. I, I will have um, a question for you as well um, regarding the, the enforcement uh, procedure structures of the DSA. So as the DSA covers uh, different activities such as online content and market uh, online marketplaces activities, do you think that the DSA provides adequate structures for the, the, the its inform, uh, enforcement regarding 
a systemic online uh, content moderation, um, both at national and European level? That would be the question. Thank you. Well, I, I guess uh, it's a tricky thing, uh, of course, is that the DSA by nature has been developed as a horizontal instrument. At the same time, we have to recognize, as you said it, that we have two key focus on it. On one side, the marketplaces with a clear uh, question on how do you uh, protect the customers of those on the marketplaces? How do you uh, create, uh, prevent uh, the harm from the, that can arise from those marketplaces? And a very different nature of, mar of, uh, of platforms, which are content platforms. I think typically of social networks, or even of search engine, I think, which are relevant in this in this case. Here, what you are exchanging, are not, in many cases, not on a commercial basis, it's content, it's information, it's uh, the capacity to participate in a public debate. Uh, and of course, uh, it's true that in both cases, we recognize that you need transparency, but the, how do you enforce the transparency? How do you make sure that the, this transparency requirement is met? is really different in both nature. Uh, the, the, the nature of the platform are really different. Of course, uh, being a media regulator, uh, a proud member of ERGA, we feel more interested by the part dealing with content platform, with social media, with search engine, because those uh, elements, those these platforms operate in what I would call the informational space. Uh, you could think of the, the Roman Forum, uh, the, the Greek Agora, uh, the place where we exchange ideas, where the public opinion uh, is formed, where you, where you brew the democracy, which is different from what takes place on marketplace. Marketplace, you trade, you trade service or you trade goods, but it's different. So clearly, yes, we, we have a question here uh, and uh, we'll see how the policy debate will uh, unfold at the AU level, both in Parliament and in the Council. Uh, and maybe we'll see uh, some evolution at some point, I suspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, we'll come to you later on when we are all together with the industry and then Maria as well. So now it's time to, to discuss uh, both regulations with uh, DSA and DMA with uh, the industry uh, members. Uh, we have a great panel as well, and we have first uh, Johan Katteler. He is uh, Director of Publicity Policy, Head of Connectivity and Access EMEA, Facebook. Hello, Johan, how are you? And Hi, hello. He was working at the ACM and we know him from Berek as well. And he, he was former member of Berek as well. So thank you, Johan, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandra. And it's a pleasure to be here today on this uh, great panel and to see uh, so many great speakers uh, next to me. Um, so I will mainly comment on the DMA, uh, but I will definitely also touch upon the broader regulatory discussions, including the DSA, um, uh, as Benoit just explained from his um, um, responsibilities. I think, let me start with DSA. Um, I think we are, as Facebook, uh, obviously, obviously we expect to be in scope of, uh, of both the DSA and the DMA, that goes without saying. I will dive a little bit deeper into the scope of the DMA later, but uh, on DSA, I think that, uh, um, we agree on all the points that uh, Benoit just made. Um, I think it's uh, it's known to many here today that Facebook has called for regulation of uh, content um, for a couple of years right now. And I'm also happy to see Benoit, Benoit now in his new capacity at CRA in France um, two years ago, I think it was. Uh, we did a pilot together with uh, uh, the French ministry and some uh, other French um, regulators um, about hate speech and how to deal with it. And Benoit was leading the French delegation. Um, and uh, I was part of the Facebook delegation uh, at that time. And uh, we tried to open up um, uh, for the regulators because we anticipated the DSA, which was not called the DSA at the time, to uh, come into force at some point. And we wanted to explain uh, better because we needed to do a better job about uh, how we deal with content regulation uh, as complex as it, as it is. I think from there, 
we have moved in a, in a very um, um, uh, constructive direction. And I think if we look at the draft DSA, we agree on uh, on the on the concepts and on many points. Uh, even though, of course, the devil is in the details, and we are engaging uh, together with the policymakers on this. Um, on the DMA, I will spend a couple of uh, minutes speaking about the DMA uh, because, of course, there um, uh, this could have uh, impact on Facebook services. It will have impact uh, on Facebook services. And I think the main question on DMA, and this I see also echoed in, in Barrick's uh, activities uh, to date, the DMA um, is now in about getting the regulation right. And when I say so, I think that it's important to think about it a little bit deeper. Because if you look at the current policy discussions in Europe and in Brussels, uh, it seems, and this is quite unique, that almost everybody, um, all stakeholders or policy makers involved are in some agreement on what the DMA should look like. And I think again here also Facebook takes the position that we believe that DMA is definitely an important and necessary step, but that we also need to get this right. And I will explain that. And I will also come, Alejandra, if you allow me, with a couple of suggestions how to make it maybe slightly better as we have seen in the draft right now. And I will also dig in a little bit from my telco experience and as a member of BERC, uh, even though I think the platforms, uh, as um, most of the people acknowledge, are very different from the traditional telco markets, as many on the on the on, on the Congress today know. I think we can learn um, quite some things also from those regimes, and I think that Barrick has been focal on a couple of those. So, if you take a little bit closer look at the DMA um, and start with the scope, I think it's uh, it's quite obvious, as I said, that Facebook will be in scope. And uh, I think also many of our tech peers expect to be in scope too. But still, the question is relevant, which companies will be in scope and which not. And I think there should be clear boundaries there. And there should also be a clear mechanism about how you will be in scope, but also how you will potentially get out of scope um, um, in certain circumstances. Then if you look a little bit deeper into the scope, I think it's also important to look at what services will be in scope. And of course, the definition of the core platform services is in the DMA. But I think it's important for all those companies that will be in scope to be perfectly clear on what this means for those services that will be in scope. Because uh, the data ecosystem, um, as I think you can best call it, is complex and also the um, lines between the different services are not continuously clear and also evolving over time. And I think this is a very important difference, for instance, if you compare it with the other Exxon regime, as we know it also from the Barrick and the, um, from the Telco experience, uh, which are more standardized markets, more predictable in terms of technology development. So uh, you had the recommendation from the European Commission about which market, markets to regulate. And now we enter this area of platforms. And once you're designated as a, as, uh, as a gatekeeper um, um, service, then you tick the boxes that you need to comply with. I think that's important to take into account about um, when you speak about getting the regulation right. Um, Separate from the scope, I think we should also acknowledge that uh, it's pretty novel what the draft DSA, a DMA proposes here. Because until now, um, what we have seen in the regimes that we know dealing with um, ex ante regulation or the competition um, related uh, regimes as we know them from Brussels and the individual member states, there was always a link to, first of all, market power and then some kind of conduct by the company. And now with the DMA, this is different because once you tick the box of being in scope, you need to comply with uh, certain rules. So when I speak about getting it right, we need to get it right that we are aware of the consequences of ticking those boxes. And I'm not saying this only because of Facebook's interest, but I think it's important to consider also the interest of the broader ecosystem where those um, gatekeeper core platform ser services operate. Um, 
quite often you see that there are um, more actors active in those ecosystems. So potential consequences on those um, services will have impact on those actors and definitely also on the consumers using those platforms. And here comes the link with the with the telco regimes. Um, since this is a barrier event, I focused a little bit on the similarities and the differences there. Here comes the, uh, the, the link with the telco regimes as we know them to date. I think there you always have the trade-offs about what the impact of the measures would be. Uh, um, and I'm not advocating for some kind of Article 7 procedure as we have seen it uh, uh, between the NRAs and the, and the European Commission, for instance. But I think there should be some mechanism where um, the impact of the uh, of the uh, of the obligations and the per se obligations in particular uh, will be measured, because the DMA is getting into the heart of the uh, product design basically of those companies, um, and that's novel. That's different from any regime we have seen um, so far. I think one key suggestion um, uh, for improvement, uh, therefore, would be, and I've seen this also in the Barrick um, opinion, basically, which I was very happy with to see, is the regulatory dialogue. And maybe um, this is also um, caused by me having over 15 years of experience with Exxonto regulation um, in telco markets and having been engaged in so many dialogues about obligations, compliance, what it means to comply with rules, leading industry groups where everybody who's affected by potential obligations uh, um, was able to um, speak about, uh, about the impact of the proposed obligations. So maybe I'm influenced still um, or carrying the weight of that, um, that past with me. But for me, it's, uh, it's not only novel, but also something where um, we should really assess the risks of of, of entering a regime where um, companies, and not only Facebook, of course, but uh, I think it will be uh, um, potentially eight, 10, maybe even more companies, will need to comply with 18, um, as it is right now, if you look at Article 5 or 6 from the DMA, 18 obliga obligations, um, some of them um, with immediate effect, uh, without potentially knowing exactly what it means to comply. And, and since it's the goal to, uh, to increase competition and to increase um, innovation and to protect consumers, I think that we should take into account all, all angles before, um, uh, before uh, imposing those. Um, I think the regulatory dialogue is one thing, and of course there's a mechanism for that in, uh, in the DMA, but I think that some of the Article uh, 5 provisions, especially those that go into the heart of the product design process, should be um, uh, coming together with this regulatory dialogue, because there could be potential harm um, for consumers as well as the broader ecosystem. I'll pause here. I'm happy to dive a little bit deeper into other aspects of the DMA or DSA in the, in the second, second instance. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Johan. That's quite quite good. Quite interesting your your point of view from from uh, from the from the Facebook perspective and, and DMA and DSA. So I, I want to pose you a question regarding taking into account that there are your experiences with telco regulation and being a member of of BEREC. Uh, what is your view on the uh, BEREC, of the better position on the DMA? especially regarding uh, what are the do's and don'ts that telco regime are uh, going to regulate uh, platforms. Thank you, Alejandra, and apologies for um, clicking away already. But um, um, I think that, uh, first of all, um, I think it's very good that Barrick is involved in the broader DMA discussions. Uh, one thing I didn't uh, mentioned just now, I think, is the, the interplay between the different legislative files. And it's not only the ECC, where, of course, the Barrick members are the first enforcer, but it's also, and I'm glad to see Benoit here also, but it's also the AVMST, for instance, that interplays with the, with the DMA um, because of the definitions used for the core platform services, being video sharing platform uh, services, as well as number independent services, which is also the scope of the, uh, the AVMST and the ECC. And I think it's uh, it's 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 key that all those files, but also the, the the general competition regime, is in line with the DMA. 
even though I know that the European Commission positions the DMA as something which is not competition law, I think we should bear in mind that it needs to exist next to existing competition law. And it's also a single market tool. So we don't want, first of all, to have a patchwork of regimes in all the countries, but also not to have a patchwork of um, enforcement crossing over, because I think that would be uh, detrimental to the single market goals and for the consumers, basically, in the in the European Union. And that point was addressed also in the Barrick opinion, Alejandra, as I've read it. So I think that's an important uh, um, uh, flag by Barrick that I would definitely like to support. I think the other one relates more to what I also already said in my first, um, first part, is also that I noticed, and I think that Barrick also speaks here from uh, its own experience, that Barrick also called out for the regulatory dialogue. Maybe not in the opinion of Barrick for all the uh, obligations as, as they were drawn out in the, in the, in the, in the DMA, but I, the way I read it, but maybe I read it in a sort of biased way, but the way I read it, it was that there was definitely a call for more dialogue because I think uh, Barrick rightly acknowledges the, the differences between the core platform services. If you look at Google, Facebook, Amazon, who will speak uh, after me uh, on this call, um, um, and um, and Apple, for instance, everybody has its own business model. So then if you have like generic obligations applying to all of those platforms, I think um, that it's uh, it's something that you need to consider carefully. And that I won't going to repeat my uh, my first remarks, but I think it it's it's obvious that and and you know this Alejandro also from your own experience, even in uh, harmonized markets across Europe, where you have like at the national level telco markets that you need to regulate, you need to have this regulatory dialogue. You need to speak with the the SMP operators to understand what it is, uh, what the impact is of a of a proposed uh, measure. So I think that's part of the Barrick opinion that we definitely uh, um, uh, would support. Definitely, I agree with you. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, we'll come to you as well when we wrap all together. And now it's time to, to give the floor, to pass the floor to James Waterworth. James Waterworth is Director of EU Policy at Amazon. So James, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to participate in this conversation today. For those of you uh, who may not be an Amazon customer already, a couple of uh, data points. Uh, I hope you are an Amazon customer, but if you're not, um, Amazon's been active in the EU for just over 20 years. Um, in the last 10 years, we've invested uh, around 75 billion euros, and we now we have seven marketplaces uh, across the EU, so seven countries in which we have primary marketplaces. We now employ about 135 thousand people in the EU, and I'm talking about Amazon employees, I'm not talking about uh, postmen and women, for example, who uh, we work with who bring packages to your front door if you've made an order from us. Um, Amazon is Amazon's primary business is as a retailer. Uh, and using Amazon's marketplace, or indeed, uh, another marketplace, a competing marketplace, allows small businesses to compete with large retailers such as Ahold, Carrefour, Lidl, Edeka, in a way that would previously not have been possible. So what does all this mean and what should we think about when it comes to the Digital Markets Act, which I want to touch on first? Well, the Digital Markets Act um, uh, provides for 18 automatically applicable obligations, the do's and don'ts of the legislation, across eight core platform services, services such as search engines, social networks, and online intermediation services. This means if you add it up, there's nearly 100 different ways that these obligations could apply. Is this sufficiently precise to ensure that no beneficial innovation is lost? I think you can tell by the way, I ask my rhetorical question that we are concerned the answer is no, and the obligations need to be more tailored to fit. There needs to be a case-by-case -case approach to what services should be regulated, something that the 
European Commission has previously recognized for regulated industry like telecoms, and something that Beric members are expert at. Telecoms is, of course, a much more homogenous activity uh, compar in comparison to the activities which will be covered by the Digital Markets Act. So it's logical that if case-by-case -case approach is necessary there, it's even more applicable for the Digital Markets Act. The Digital Markets Act ex ante, an automatic approach, puts a disproportionate focus on speed of enforcement over fair process and quality of outcomes. It could lead to significant and undesirable unintended consequences. This tension cannot be resolved with the current setup of the DMA. Um, what we need to ensure is that there is a proper regulatory dialogue for all obligations before they come into effect. Companies should be able to present reasons why obligations should not apply or to discuss how they should apply. Let me give you three examples of why this might be necessary, and I'll keep them brief. Firstly, to ensure strong competition in retail and competitive prices. A recent study that I saw by the Belgian Consumer Authority, uh, Organization sorry, showed that where Dutch chains had opened shops in Belgium, prices were 7% lower than in a comparable chain in a different part of the country. For people on a median salary, retail prices matter. A blunt measure like the DMA should clearly not reduce competitive pressure on large retailers. Secondly, we need to ensure we prevent fraud. Thirdly, we need to ensure we keep consistency high levels of innovation. Two examples of what I mean here. Firstly, innovation such as voice assistance. For the billion people on the planet who have some form of disability, voice assistants provide access to important online services in a way which other people take for granted. This innovation is not trivial, it is vital. We need to ensure the rules of the DMA uh, facilitate ongoing innovation of this kind. Secondly, research I saw by Oxira published a couple of weeks ago shows that regulations such as the DMA could reduce expenditure on innovation by around three and a half billion euros a year in the EU by reducing competitive pressure on local players. That would be an undesirable outcome. Moving on secondly to the DSA. It's obviously welcome, and we welcome the fact that the DSA reconfirms the core principles of the e-commerce uh, e directive, such as the country of origin principle and no general monitoring obligation. The DSA, like the e-commerce directive before it, is horizontal in nature and sets rules for all online services. But that means it cannot address every sectoral challenge. We will always need rules like the Copyright Directive, the Terrorist Content Online Regulation, or importantly for a retailer like Amazon, rules on product safety and market surveillance. In some aspects, the DSA deviates from this horizontal approach. For example, it requires marketplaces to verify traders, a practice we very strongly support. To give you an example from 2020, only 6% of attempts to create accounts on Amazon past our robust verification processes. Beyond uh, trader verification, there are other parts of the DSA which seem to have been drafted with specific services in mind, but nevertheless apply to everybody. The sale of a toothbrush is completely different to the uploading and distribution of a video. Social media and video sharing platforms the sharing of content can quickly uh, grow exponentially, and this may raise specific questions. If that's what the very large online platforms chapter seeks to address, then we need to limit it to those types of services. The upcoming General Product Safety Directive, something I'm sure every regulator on this call is extremely familiar with, is the best place to legislate for product safety, and the European Com Commission will be publishing its proposal in June this year. The correct goal of the DSA is to protect people, 
and to ensure a high level of confidence in online services. It is therefore strange to see a higher level of protection only for retail sales made on Amazon, because it is a very large online platform. All customers deserve the same level of protection wherever they shop. Finally, on enforcement, coordination is desirable, especially in cross-border commerce or cross-border settings. For content moderation, I am sure the digital services coordinators proposed in the DSA may help to resolve conflicts. As a retailer, the practical reality is we will continue to deal with more than 500 European product regulators across, for example, product safety, environmental compliance, chemicals, intellectual property, and much more. For many of these questions, the DSA will be far too blunt of an instrument. So in conclusion, the DMA should cater for case-by-case -case assessments so we avoid negative unintended consequences, and the DSA should not try to deal with issues such as product safety, where other legislation will do this more effectively. Secondly, this legislation should protect all consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, James. I uh, absolutely agree with you with uh, the not overlapping uh, idea of both regulations uh, within the current, the current regulation that we have. So I have a question for you regarding the DMA. You, are, you have talked uh, about possible and intended consequences. You, you then talked about, uh, you mentioned the possibility of incre increased fraud. Could you, could you give me a more, more detailed example of, about this? About this? Sure, yeah. I, I think one of the most important and to make the DMA and the DSA coherent with each other, which they should be, is preventing fraud, clearly something the, the DSA sets out to do. Um, if we look at the DMA, one of the provisions for those following the text closely, it's Article 5C, seeks to ensure that a small business using an online intermediary can uh, communicate directly with uh, customers. Um, what we know from transactional uh, services like Amazon is that because money changes hand, unfortunately, there is a risk of fraud. And indeed, this is acknowledged by the public authorities. So we see every year that Europol comes out with advice to online shoppers before Christmas every year. And their number one piece of advice is only to use trusted services. And if we were to end up with a situation where consumers were to be brought into contact with untrusted uh, sellers, without the protection that is provided to them by using a trusted brand such as Amazon with all the consumer guarantees that we put in place, then we could lead to a situation which other authorities are explicitly warning against. And we should be mindful not to facilitate fraud. And the second thing I want to mention is a completely different consideration. Um, one of the provisions in the DMA requires that the service provide uh, objective ranking, the words are slightly different, but it's effectively what it is, objective ranking in results on a page. Um, and the trouble with working out what is objective is that sometimes that can be quite subjective. Uh, let me give you a theoretical example. Uh, if Amazon were to introduce, indeed we have in some for some products, a uh, an environmental label. We have a, a badge today called Climate Pledge Friendly. Uh, and we were to integrate that into our ranking parameters, there would be some brands who would be happy with that uh, model of displaying products and some brands who would be unhappy with that model of displaying products. And it will be difficult for uh, us to know which is the right objective result without being able to have either the freedom to run our business or to have a proper case-by-case -case dialogue with regulatory authorities. Great. That's a good example. Um, thank you very much, uh, James. And now I'll, I'll give the floor to David Wildham. He's a Group Director for Policy and Public Affairs of Sky. David, you have the floor. Hello, Alejandra. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. I'm back at uh, the IIC 
again and on a forum with such esteemed uh, regulators. Uh, I'm just looking forward to the moment that uh, we can all be together in person again. Um, so look, I'm going to take a slightly contrary view to the uh, positions taken by Johan James about both the DSA and the DMA. Um, so at least we can have some debate here uh, because consensus, frankly, um, uh, is, is less exciting. But I think I just quickly wanted to um, outline where Sky sits in all of this. And remember, Sky is a, a broadcaster, a, an internet service provider, a mobile provider, and a, a, an OTT provider. So we're across a, a, a whole series of heavily regulated sectors in broadcasting and telecom, subject to content rules and uh, ex ante rules for all of our existence. Um, and, and we are operating, of course, across Europe in six countries with, with 24 million customers. And so from our perspective, the DSA and the DMA aren't necessarily radical or, or novel. Um, and in, in many ways, they're founded on regulatory concepts that are pretty well understood and, and proven uh, in, in EU law. I mean, if anything, I think we're rather late to the party in all of this. It's, it's pretty unusual. It's highly unusual for companies with such massive economic and societal impacts to go unregulated for so long. And of course, uh, we all know that a number of countries have recognized that and, and have begun to impose and create their own national frameworks, national interventions, whether that's Nets DG in, in Germany or the or the hate speech law in France and the and the and the Digital Competition Act in Germany. So the imperative now it seems to us is to is to address the the issues that have been identified in in Europe and in those countries and at the same time ensure the integrity of, of the single market, which is vital to all of us. And I think all the companies on this platform would agree that the integrity of the single market is is, is vital to um, our business operations and to good um, uh, customer and citizen outcomes uh, uh, across across Europe. The, but the, the the reason why I say I don't think that these instruments are necessarily novel is that in many ways they are bringing in sort of well trodden um, uh, regulatory concepts, or, or indeed they are um, bringing accountability to things that are already going on uh, and that's particularly the case in the DSA where content moderation is being undertaken already by online intermediaries by platforms the issue really is about oversight and accountability and I think it's a slightly false premise to suggest that the DSA is in any way creating a, 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 a dilemma or a dichotomy between uh, online um, freedoms uh, and uh, uh, and safety. Actually, those two things are one and the same, as the platforms themselves recognise, and, and that's why they do take action. But they take action that is unaccountable, uh, and the DSA, I think, is a welcome step in bringing some accountability and transparency to what they're doing. Similarly, I think the DMA follows a, a well-trodden path of ex-ante rules applying to companies that have a significant power in the market. Now, I appreciate, uh, and I, you know, listening to Johan with his former telecoms regulator hat on, there are some significant differences, um, and particularly in the way in which the rules will be applied. But the, 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 the rules themselves are ones that are well understood. For example, the Telecom's framework already applies various ex ante rules or allows the application of ex ante rules that include the opening up of networks and restrictions on bundling, for example. Um, so again, I think those are well understood concepts. The application of them is going to be different in the DMA because we are applying those rules to a, a different type of sector, um, but they're not novel in and of themselves. And of course, it is the, these kinds of rules are precisely what help companies like Sky grow and develop, in particularly in the telecoms uh, market, into profitable and responsible businesses today that, that benefit uh, uh, many millions of, of EU citizens. Uh, the second pillar about the national impact, I think that 
we all should recognize there is obviously a big debate going on about enforcement and in particular national versus eu competence and, and of course erga is right to stress this in the context of the dsa as being a key part of the discussion um each member state is going to have their own context to consider uh and of course we you know we're operating in six different countries so we understand how those differences can be applied um and in fact, we take lessons from uh, AVMSD and the telecoms framework where uh, NRAs play a, a crucial um, oversight role within the single market. But there does need to be clarity, I think, on what uh, extent member states can apply national rules. Um, I mean, for example, the DMA states that national legislation can't target gatekeepers. But what about other definitions? In Germany, for example, you have the undertakings with paramount significance for competition across markets. Is this the same or different from Gatekeeper? And I think there's some interesting questions there to be explored. I think we probably have some natural sympathy with the view that enforcement can't only be left to uh, the Commission. Uh, and um, also, I think, you know, would, would welcome the, the idea of the, the, the European Digital Services Board, which is sort of going to be a key role in guiding and coordinating uh, that um, uh, that enforcement. Then I just want to just touch before I leave on two areas where I think um, the uh, rules could be um, improved or indeed where there might be some um, significant risks. Uh, the first area of risk actually is really the interplay with uh, other legislation that a number of panelists have, have raised. I think the Commission's response and approach here is logical. Um, that, so the proposed regulations need to complement and not replace the sector-specific laws. The last thing we want to do is to create a double jeopardy. Um, uh, and I think in relation to the DMA specifically, we need to give care to those areas that are already regulated under AVMSD or the EECC. Um, uh, and, you know, there is a debate that I have heard uh, going on that the scope of the DMA ought to be widened or thresholds should be changed to make it future proof. But actually, there is a real risk there that you're going to create double jeopardy uh, for companies that are already facing significant regulation and indeed ex ante rules, uh, which would not be good for those sectors or for the uh, European economy. Um, and then the second area I just want to flag is, is kind of a key part of, art, of, of, uh, of the DSA, um, uh, Article 6, which is really goes to the issue of liability, which um, I, I know is one that gets the platforms in particular very exercised and is, is a, an area of global controversy. Um, I think it's interesting that Article 6 within the DSA does appear to be inspired a little bit by um, the Section 230 of the uh, US uh, Communications Decency Act, um, which I, I find somewhat surprising that the, the Commission should have gone down that route and, and adopted something um, extraterritorial. Um, I, think, I think I would take the view on that specifically that um, we, we do not think that uh, you know, hosts that can claim to be eligible for immunity when in fact uh, we know that jurisprudence, the, 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 um, the CGEU has already said that disabling access to content doesn't make you liable. It's the promoting of content that makes you liable. Uh, and we're not sure that Article 6 really reflects that properly. Uh, we certainly um, welcome the need for more legal certainty and immunity, but only for truly passive intermediaries. Um, uh, and we would like to see that those positions, uh, the position of, of, of those platforms that optimize content uh, means that they don't rely on liability exemptions in the same way as truly passive uh, platforms. Uh, I think that's an interesting debate. It's one actually that was raised um, by um, Nick Clegg this week, um, uh, Johann's, um, one of Johan's bosses, um, uh, in an article where he said that, that it's not practical for a platform like Facebook to be liable for billions of posts each day. But again, I think when we look at other areas of regulation, my mind goes straight to banking, 
and the billions of financial transactions that um, uh, go on each day and regulated banks are held responsible for compliance with money laundering regulations and, and undertake due diligence so that they know their customers. And it does seem to us that that is something uh, that is uh, perfectly um, uh, plausible for a, a platform to be, um, to be responsible for. So putting it more, more broadly, the, the, both of these regulations, I think, are a step in the right direction. And uh, I don't think that, that, the, that, that they're particularly novel uh, in concept. The important thing is that the main objective is to deal with specifically identified and systemic problems that stem from particular business models of what are a handful of large and dominant companies in the digital space uh, and that we don't end up with uh, double jeopardy for the rest of the European economy. Thank you, David. Um, that was a uh, very, very imp important point of view from, from Sky. Um, I come back to, to the, one, the things that you mentioned in your, uh, your speech regarding the DMA, regarding consistency. Um, so, uh, in, in rules applies in the DMA. So, how do, do you think we may, or the European Commission in this, in this regulation will uh, ensure consistency in the rules that apply to all sides of uh, businesses while, while avoiding barriers to entering the market? How do you think that could be done? That's, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? And, and I think, you know, for us, it's about proportionality. Um, you know, we, we completely understand that one size doesn't fit all. Um, but but let's take the example of the physical world relating to the traceability of traders. Um, we don't really see why that shouldn't apply to the whole ecosystem. Uh, why should Article 22 of the DSA, the Know Your Business Customer, only apply to online marketplaces when we know that there are thousands of big and small online services which are not marketplaces but which facilitate potentially criminal activities and are accessible via other platforms? Um, and yet those platforms are not going to be required to know anything about those users and those customers. And that seems to me to be an inconsistency in the application of rules. Um, and I, I think that's something that I hope will come out uh, in the, in the uh, debates around uh, particularly that instrument. Um, you know, we have, we have many due diligence uh, obligations that we need to follow. Um, and, and breaking any of the rules can mean that we lose our license to broadcast. And it doesn't matter whether we're whether we're big or small or, or old or young in the market. You can be a single channel and still lose your license to operate if you disobey the rules. And it's that consistency that gives confidence to both businesses entering the market and also to users. Uh, who um, know that the same rules apply to to everybody, and I, I think that's going to be a really important principle in in these uh, rules. Thank you, thank you, David. So we, we come back to we come back to you when we are all together. And now it's time for Carlos Rodriguez Cocina. He's uh, director for European Regulatory Affairs, head of Brussels office for Telefonica. Hello, Carlos. Hello, Alejandra. Uh, can you hear me well? Everything okay? We listen to you a little bit low. I will. I will speak a little bit louder then. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandra, and thanks for the invitation to IIC and, and Berek uh, to Telefonica to participate in this panel. And um, I would like to start my remarks with the DMA, indicating why uh, Telefonica, as a telecom operator, cares about uh, the DMA. And I would like to leave you also a couple of ideas in terms of. Uh, how do we think ex-ante regulation of online gatekeeping platforms should be tackled in the DMA? And what are the areas of improvement that we see in this provision? And afterwards, I will touch upon a little bit on, on our views on the DSA as well. So starting with, uh, with the point on why do we care, which is not perhaps evident for, for a telecoms operator. Um, first, we care because we share the Commission's vision that there is a need for fairness and contestability in the online platform economy. 
and we, ha we have reached this conclusion based on our experience as competitors and as partners of the companies that uh, potentially will qualify as online gatekeeping platforms. First, as competitors, what we have seen in the last years is that a number of these companies have entered the space that we have traditionally occupied in the provision of voice, uh, messaging and video services, but they have done so with a very different regulatory regime than the one that we have on our backs. So basically with no regulatory constraints compared to ourselves, which leads to a situation of uh, unequal uh, competitive uh, market. So. Basically, from that perspective, um, we have seen how, how things have changed during the, during the last years. And now this is happening also in the remit of uh, infrastructure to the extent that we're in a process of virtualization of network infrastructure. And we see these companies also entering into that space, potentially disintermediating ourselves from our end customers and becoming a sort of pervasive force end to end in the whole digital value chain. So if we look at our perspective um, as, uh, let's say, partners of these companies and the commercial relationship that we have with them, what we see is a case of losing uh, bargaining power on ourselves through the years uh, because of the phenomenal power that these companies are acquiring. So from both perspectives, we think that the DMA can have a potential beneficial effect in terms of taming uh, or curtailing this trend of overexpansion of these companies across the digital value chain in terms of providing more opportunities, more innovation, more competitiveness in the digital economy. All these should be uh, positive uh, outcomes and results of this provision. Now, in terms of how to tackle ex-ante regulation of online gatekeeping platforms, this is, of course, the big challenge. And what we have said here constantly is that we should look at the experience that we have with the telecoms regulatory framework as many of our uh, previous speakers and, and fellow panelists have indicated. And this has been one of the core uh, contributions of, of Telefonica, reflecting on how 20 years of telecoms regulatory framework, with all its flaws, but also with all its successes in promoting competition, could lead to, um, to good learnings for, uh, for the DMA. We have the experience in terms of how to identify relevant markets, how to um, uh, signal companies that have significant market power, and how to impose remedies on those companies. And we're actually quite happy to see uh, that some of that philosophy has permeated in the DMA as well. There is um, some level of comparison that you could establish between core platform services and relevant markets. And there is some, some level of comparison that you can establish between uh, being considered as an online gatekeeping platform and having significant market power. And at the end, there is also some parallelism between the obligations in the DMA and the, and the remedies that are imposed under the telecoms regulatory framework. However, what are the points that can be improved in the, in the DMA? Because nothing is perfect, right? So, um, so there are a couple of things that can be, uh, in our view, um, uh, improved. One from a general perspective and one for a more concrete and specific perspective. From a general perspective, and it has been mentioned before, the institutional setup concentrates too much power on the commission and perhaps does not uh, reflect enough um, the contribution that may come from the national competent authorities, including uh, the members of BEREC, the national regulatory authorities, because precisely of all this experience that they have gathered uh, with 20 years of application of the telco regulatory framework. So from this perspective, we feel that um, these are actually the authorities that have the closest perspective of the, of the individual markets, and they can be very useful in terms of uh, monitoring uh, the compliance with the obligations, defining actually the remedies, monitoring compliance, and, and in the final enforcement become also a sort of a, of a one-stop shop or, or a first point of contact for business users or end users that may have complaints uh, about um, the, the way obligations may not be uh, uh, fulfilled by, by the online gatekeeping platforms. Um, we see some room also for, uh, for national authorities in the regulatory dialogue understood uh, from our perspective as a, as a way of defining the technical implementation of the obligations, not that much as a way of determining obligations that are directly or not directly applicable, also also be uh, directly applicable, but as a way of determining what would be the technical requirements for the accomplishment of those, of those obligations. And the second point of improvement that we will see in the DMA is uh, something related to a subject very dear to our hearts and is a little bit provocative, we know. Um, but this is um, the comparison between the net neutrality regime that we have as telco operators versus the lack of a neutrality regime in the services world. 
or in the services space. As you know, we have these uh, net neutrality provisions that impede us from blocking, throttling, or discriminating in favor of our own products and services in the network space. Uh, but we do not have something similar for services. And if we look nowadays at the uh, hurdles or burdens that users may have when accessing any content of their choice, any service of their choice, through any device of their choice, these hurdles happen in other layers of the value chain, not in the access network, but in other parts of the digital value chain. And we do have references to the open internet and some scattered provisions in the DMA that point into this direction. For instance, and it was mentioned in one of the first speeches, this idea of uh, end users being able to uninstall, pre-install applications or use the applications or software of their choice. But there is nothing structured as such as, as something that we could identify as a digital neutrality provision. How to do this in our view? Uh, we have this uh, prohibition on Article 6 about self-preferencing, but very limited. So for only pointing at ranking results of search engines, we could uh, um, deduct that is related to, uh, to that sort of activity. Um, but in our view, this should be much broader. And this uh, prohibition of self-preferencing should uh, tackle the core platform services in a way that would allow us to ensure that this neutrality regime happens at the network level and at the services level as well to the benefit mainly of end users. So those are the, the points that we um, identify as most relevant uh, in the DMA. In the DSA, our perspective is, uh, is a slightly different. Uh, here again, we have, uh, let's say, the same vision than the Commission in terms of uh, the importance of ensuring confidence and trust in the digital economy. And I think that uh, uh, the risk of a backlash or a, or a less, uh, lesser level of engagement from, from end users is there. So, uh, so we need to ensure that there is uh, confidence and trust in, in, uh, in the products and services that they access online. But here we have a, a twofold perspective. As connectivity providers, we like, on the one hand, the idea of preserving the exemption of liability for mere conduit uh, uh, providers, such as ourselves, and for passive or neutral uh, hosting and catching uh, services providers. Um, but at the same time, we are content owners and, and we generate and invest in content. We actually spend over 2 billion euros in producing and acquiring content. And from that perspective, we like the idea that the DSA is moving into innovative ways of tackling illegal content. Uh, there is one particular aspect that we like, and this is the, the notion of the trusted flaggers and the idea of, uh, of the importance and the relevance that these players may have in terms of identifying illegal content and having some sort of priority process to, uh, to act uh, against the legal content that they have identified. Perhaps on, on the DSA, the biggest challenge that exists is uh, how to treat the myriad of digital services that have been evolving uh, since the adoption of the e-commerce directive. And we think that the um, asymmetric approach that is followed is the right one. So the level of obligations cannot be the same uh, on a platform that has uh, enormous capabilities to interact uh, uh, with the user-generated content, uh, editorial capabilities, technical capabilities to tackle uh, and take down illegal content, than in a player such as, uh, for instance, a cloud provider that does not have the visibility uh, or the capacity to identify uh, this sort of content and to act against it. So uh, that is a good, uh, a good starting point. The problem here is that uh, size perhaps is not enough. And I mean that because sometimes it's micro enterprises or small and medium sized enterprises that play a very, very important role in terms of disseminating illegal content. So we have to reflect in terms of what could be a risk based approach um, that would allow us to tackle the situation with, when it's SMEs or micro enterprises, the ones that are playing a very impactful role in the dissemination of illegal content. Other than that, uh, we have, of course, uh, a preference for harmonization and more, uh, let's say, homogeneous approach um, to the concept of notice and, and takedown and, or, or, or action taken on, on the process of, of notification of illegal content and very particular preference for a stay down obligations because one of the problems that we're seeing is that sometimes illegal content is taken down, but it reappears again uh, online. Uh, so it's necessary to take uh, actually measures that can ensure that this is uh, not uh, not happening. So overall, I would say that on the side of Telefonica, we are uh, welcoming both the DMA and the DSA to ensure fairness, to ensure contestability, and to ensure confidence for end users in the digital market. So this is our position. And with that, I end my opening remarks, Alejandra. 
Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, great to hear that you are happy with the Spanish regulation. That was a joke. <laughs> I mean, uh, we are very happy with uh, your comments and on the DMA and how you, you have taken very much into account the developed position and on the DMA. And then I would like to ask you a question regarding um, if you are as a, as a telecom operator, do you are, are you concerned that the DMA regulation evolves in that way that could affect uh, operators such as Telefonica? Well, this is a, a pertinent question, Alejandra, and I think the, the short answer would be no, because electronic communications networks and services are explicitly uh, taken out of the scope of the DMA. Uh, however, a number of independent interpersonal communication services, so services such as WhatsApp, are within the scope. And we think this is right, because uh, in the electronic communications code, these services had a different um, range of obligations than the one provided by traditional players. There was the perception that uh, by being pan-European or regional, they could not be subject to general authorization processes granted by national regulatory authorities. So at the end, they got out of that process with a, a lower level of obligations compared to, to our terms. So we think that is logical that now they are included in the DMA. Now the problem, the hiccup that we have here is that when cross-referencing the code in Article 1, the DMA is actually making a mistake and giving the impression that all interpersonal communication services should be included under the scope of the DMA. We believe it's a mistake because it contradicts the provisions of the preamble and the recital. So we want to make clear and sure that uh, only number independent interpersonal communication services are within the scope of this provision. So um, I think that um, we see a direction of travel for the DMA, and this is not pointing to telecom operators. Perhaps one one that we um, that we need to point out um, is the fact that uh, the DMA may be a little bit over expensive uh, when providing the Commission the ability of the cap capability of tackling emerging uh, gatekeeping platforms. And in that sense, uh, we actually agree with Beric in the sense that there should be some form of guidance or methodology established to determine when um, those companies could qualify as such, because otherwise you may be uh, ended up killing the potential competitors of the innovative companies that may rise in the market. So our concern on the scope was more into that direction than into being uh, subject to the provision ourselves as the operators. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. And now it's time to, to join all together. Um, Anne Marie, Benoit, James, uh, David, Carlos, thank you, and Johanna. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, now that we are together, uh, do, do, do you have some any kind of reactions uh, with uh, all the, the, the ideas that have uh, expressed? By by yourself, any of one, any of you want to to express the idea about what the the other, the other one have have said? If not, we have happy. Some. Yeah, happy to respond to a couple of things, uh, Alejandra. Thank you. Uh, but I don't want to steal the floor because I'm also conscious of time. But I will try to be brief. It's more <laughs> that um, I think that. Uh, David, as well as Carlos, made a couple of uh, remarks that uh, I found really interesting, of course. And uh, um, I think it's good to reiterate maybe something I said in first instance and also dive a little bit deeper just for the interest of the discussion. Um, I think that uh, on the on the novelty of the DMA, let's look at that a little bit uh, again. Uh, I think that there is a difference. Uh, there, There is novelty in the DMA, as I said. In first instance, and even though some of the uh, of the obligations in the draft DMA might sound or look like uh, obligations as we know them from, for instance, the telco regime or from competition cases, and we might be familiar with the terminology. I think the point I would wanted to make is that applying those without any form of impact assessment with all. Uh, stakeholders in the broader ecosystem um, taken into account is novel. Um, so I think that aspect is a, no an, a novelty that I wanted to emphasize. So the per se prohibitions that kick in for uh, gatekeeper services, I think that's novel. 
And then and maybe that's also a comment on uh, some of the things that Carlos said in the in the last uh, um, in the last part, um, and which also relates about Peric, of course, and the ECC and the interplay between the ECC and the DMA and uh, the differences or maybe uh, some of the similarities between traditional telco services and, um, and number independent ICS services as they are uh, also defined in the in the scope of the DMA. I think that uh, first of all, um, uh, I don't see, uh, but I'm also curious to hear from Barrack, but I don't see this also in the Barrack opinion, I don't see as the, D the DMA as an additional um, um, piece of legislation correcting or steering the ECC. I see it as something which coexists next to the ECC. And uh, we should also bear in mind, and the same goes for AVMSD, by, uh, by the way, that the ECC is now only starting to get into enforcement. Uh, uh, only four or five countries have transposed to date. So we are now um, uh, facing uh, uh, an era where the ECC will be transposed in the same with AVMSD by Benoit and his colleagues. Um, um, and I also think that the DMA rightly points out that these are regimes that coexist um, uh, next to each other. So I agree with Carlos that, um, uh, and with Barak also, by the way, that uh, it needs to be perfectly clear when the DMA is final how this is related to to the to the ECC, for instance. But I also want to emphasize that the ECC is the ECC because it's well thought through, acknowledging some of the nature of the uh, of the number independent ICS being different from the traditional telco services. That said, of course, yeah, um, uh, we all agree that um, um, platforms um, or uh, core platforms uh, will be in scope of the DMA for obvious reasons because there could be uh, there could be um, um, uh, problems with these platforms that um, that could uh, that should be addressed by the DMA. But I I think this is complementary to the regimes as we know, know them to date. Thank you, thank you, Johan, for clearing us uh, some ideas and regarding the the overlapping between ACC and, and DMA. Um, Beric is working as well in, in in this in this regard. So uh, we soon will have a, some document regarding the, the interplay between ECC and DMA. Uh, that, that, that's that's for sure. So um, now can we do do. Uh, Pass the floor to any of you. Do you have any any of you want to to react to the the other points of view, or should we go to questions posed by the floor? Okay. So now um, take it into account that um, we are talking about both both pieces of regulation, DMA and DSA. I would like to to ask Anne Marie uh, firstly, uh, what are the in your point of, from your point of view the interfaces between DMA and and DSA? Anne Marie. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Alejandra. And maybe to take also Johan's point uh, on board, it is of course there's a lot of legislation um, uh, at the on the discussion at the moment, and then even the ECC has not been implemented um, in the majority of the uh, the member states. So, uh, and I fully agree with uh, the view that um, Johan said the DMA is not guiding uh, the code; it will coexist, and it it, it needs fine tuning. In wording, um, and as you said, Alejandra and Beric, we are are looking into that. Um, but of course, that is that is in the, in the in the stage of I think fine tuning um, because the scope, um, as I think Carlos rightly pointed out, the scope of the code is completely different from the scope of the DMA. Um, so where they where they touch, we must be make sure that um, that we know what's what. But in general, I think it is very clear that they are two separate things. Uh, having said that, the DMA and the DSA are being developed together, so that is a whole different challenge. Um, I think uh, from, um, uh, well, one of the things that I, I, I think both emphasize is the importance of transparency. And I think that there is, of course, given the different goals of the, the, these two pieces of legislation, they take different angles and rightfully so, uh, but it is, um, well, let's just say a challenge for the co-legislators to make sure that they get it right. For example, um, at the DMA, it states um, uh, things in the order uh, as that uh, core plat large platforms, large gatekeepers should make clear what their policies are. 
whereas the DSA gives uh, and gives the right and to make sure that they know what, for example, the ad policy is. Uh, the example, uh, the, the purely the theoretical example, uh, for example, um, that Amazon uh, made on the green labels on their ranking, um, as, as far as I understand, it is uh, uh, it is important that uh, consumers understand why one chooses one set of ranking uh, instead of another. So do I know I have a, uh, a ranking, that I'm looking at a ranking that favors uh, a green label that is an Amazon green label over no green label or no Amazon green label. Um, so these kind of transparency uh, issues are in both and I think it is very important that they have both and I also understand that the DSA is uh, much more on consumer rights and protection and content, so it's a, it has a different angle. So I do think they complement each other. And the one candidate that we haven't mentioned yet is the platform to business um, uh, part, which is also, of course, one piece of the puzzle, which is um, in, in experience uh, halfway between uh, the EECC and the EMA, just to make things uh, complicated. Um, I think we all know that legislation um, sometimes um, uh, can benefit from streamlining but you know this is um, one does draft uh, laws at the moment that problems arise so uh, there you are um, so I do think that in this in the streamlining and the working out of definitions we need to make sure that we we, we have um, we uniform our definitions where it is possible we uniform them when we apply when we apply them and we are very very clear at the outset uh, which uh, which pieces of legislation have which goals and also which uh, uh, regulator or um, authority that will uh, that will apply them. Um, but I'm sure that the DMA and DSA, as they are following the same path, that will be made sure by the co legislators that that is uh, harmonized to the maximum extent. Thank you, thank you, Marie. And now we have a question for for Benoit. Um, regarding the interplay, we're always uh, talking about interplay between different regulations. Now, DSA and, and Directive, uh, ABA and MSD, do you think a, a systemic uh, uh, whereby all provision relating to systemic content moderation by online platforms would be laid down in a single European legal instrument would appear to be preferable? Which, which one? Thank you. Well, I guess um, it's a tricky question because at the end of the day, we we want to protect the internal market. We want to prevent fragmentation, and uh, at the same time, uh, we need to be relevant locally because people live locally. They are all European citizens, but still they identify themselves to the local environment, uh, the cultural uh, environment. So we will need to, to do both, I guess, and uh, to have a systemic approach, uh, I guess, at EU level in developing this framework and uh, to be uh, pragmatic and dynamic in uh, applying it uh, locally. And uh, that's why uh, we really think that at the heart of the DSA in the future, as a policy discussion with, uh, will unfold, discussion on how you organize uh, governance of regulation will be strategic. We know the key ingredients, uh, national regulators, the EU Commission, and the network of involving both the national regulators and the Commission. And we are really looking forward to see how this thing can unfold and uh, can, uh, because that's where we think the solution will be uh, in um, trying to build something which uh, have to be systemic, uh, uh, to be EU wide, to exist EU wide, to uh, to prevent uh, uh, prevent the market fragmentation. At the same time, it have to be dynamic, to provide answers locally, taking into account uh, the specificity of each of our member states uh, or of the timing. Typically, if you have something taking place in France just on the eve of a national election. Uh, you have to take that into account. Uh, next day, it will be in another country with a different context. So this, the, the key will be how you, you frame the network and the governance of the network and how we manage in the future, moving forward, to think of ourselves as national regulators, but member of, a, of an EU network. 
So I guess from now on, we are typically speaking for myself, we are CSA, a proud member of Ergo. Yeah, we are waiting for next plenary and on Tuesday we will discuss on the, the new document on DSA in Erga. So we'll see, we'll see what Erga has to say about that. Thank you. So we have a question for Johan. Um, so again, re regarding the interplay between different legislative files, uh, how do you see this interplay between these different uh, files, such as DMA, DSA, the EEC, and ABSMD? More or less, you have addressed that, but could you could you concrete a little bit about that? Thank you, Jahan. I think we have Jahan. Mm -hmm. Have we we have lost Jahan? Okay. Um, we will continue with uh, perhaps James. Um, we have a question for James as well. So, regarding the DSA, James, and, and this and the, and the necessary content, can you provide provide some more details about what you already do to stop uh, the sale of counterfeit or unsafe products, please? Sure. Yeah. Important question, and important that the. Twin legislative initiatives support this and, and don't undermine it. Um, I think, I mean, there are a number of things we do uh, ourselves today. Uh, I'm going to list a few. Um, we have something inside Amazon called the Counterfeit Crimes Unit, which is a specialist unit that works with uh, both brands who may suffer from intellectual property infringement and with the public sector to bring prosecutions jointly. We did one, for example, in Italy recently with the fashion brand Tino. So we brought a joint prosecution of uh, a counterfeiter who had been uh, trying to trade counterfeits online. Um, so that's one initiative. And it's and it's vital, of course, that counterfeiting and intellectual property infringement is not a punishment-free crime. Uh, the role of the public sector is vital because while we can and do prevent sales, uh, refund people in case there would be an abuse. Uh, only the public sector can take the necessary action to try to prevent this happening a second or third uh, time when someone is uh, infringing. Um, beyond that, we have uh, initiative, something called brand registry. So for example, there are uh, thousands, or I think now hundreds of thousands of brands who provide uh, basic details of some of their intellectual property uh, to a database which allows us to better enforce uh, their IP. Uh, let me give you a, a, a theoretical example. There may be a brand which um, uh, makes many different types of accessories but doesn't make sunglasses. Um, and uh, so we can use that information that if we see a famous brand name printed on a pair of sunglasses, we can say, hey, uh, they must be fake because they told us they don't make sunglasses. Um, with some brands, we also provide special permissions in terms of being able to access counterfeit listings on our service so that they can go in and suspend sales. Now, we are very careful about the allocation of those privileges because uh, we wouldn't want uh, something to go wrong and legitimate listings to be suppressed. Uh, but that gives an additional example. And I think just turning to product safety, which is equally important. And as I mentioned, there will be European legislation on this topic next month. Um, we have a number of cooperation well, systems ourselves, but cooperations also with uh, surveillance authorities. And one of the things that we would like to see improved is recall notices. So uh, you or, or notices about unsafe products. Um, there are uh, moments when unsafe products, we will receive a notification from an authority which is very unspecific and means we are unable to identify a specific product which is unsafe. That is not good enough. Uh, if a public authority has information about an unsafe product, it should be providing it uh, in a precise format. And we would like to see this further improved and specified in upcoming legislation. So that gives you a flavor of some of the things that we do now and some of the things that we hope 
will happen soon uh, to improve further the situation. Great, James. That's there are very good examples to to prevent from unsafe products. Good for you. Now we, I think we 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 have uh, Jahan with us. Um, hi, Jahan. Hi yes. Yeah, I I got your question and then I disappeared. I think it was not because of the yeah. question. So don't worry. And, uh, yeah, I there was something with connectivity. So what's the problem? If you work in connectivity, then it hits you if you're on a panel, right? But here I am, <laughs> back again. Yeah, happens to all of us. Yeah, no, no. Well, I, I wanted to ask you regarding the, um, the the interplay between the different legislative files uh, between the DMA and the ESA, EEC and, and uh, Media Directive. Uh, how do you see this this uh, interplay between these legislative files? Yeah, I think I covered a bit of that already in my uh, previous uh, intervention. So I think, uh, first of all, uh, it's it's important to make this fit. Um, um, and I think that uh, some other speakers uh, um, highlighted this too, especially uh, Anna Marie and Benoit, who have to deal with the enforcement together with the, the, the new um, authority that will uh, enforce the DSA and the DMA. So um, having this clear about um, um, Who's dealing with what is one thing, but I think also at the institutional level, it's, it should be perfectly clear that um, um, that uh, it's important to, to know who's responsible. Also, and here I'm re reiterating what I said in the first instance, because of the, uh, the conversation, you need to be able to speak to a regulator if you need to comply with rules. And if you have overlap, between those, then it will make those complex. Um, that said, I think that, and I think that Erga as well as Barrick, uh, irrespective of the way they are structured, uh, whether it's like a more like a federation or a more like informal network uh, of, uh, of of uh, authorities coming together, I think you should also uh, use those mechanisms to to do what's best for Europe and the single market. So um, I think. Um, um, and therefore, I also like this panel, uh, Anna Marie, speaking from a regulator, which is a convergent regulator with uh, multidisciplinary powers. Uh, yourself, Alejandra, uh, the same with CNMC, um, and uh, Benoit, with their experience both on the telco and competition side as well as on the, on media. I think it's important to look at this um, um, hint um, um, uh, with all the legislative files at hand. Am I still? Can you still hear me? Because I see somebody disappearing. Okay, yeah. Now it's somebody else with connectivity problems, but yeah. Um, Alejandra, you're back. I think I lost you there. But, um, so I think that's uh, that's more or less uh, what I would like to emphasize. Maybe one example. Um, also, I think it's important we have to draft DMA and DSA right now, but of course there are a lot of negotiations uh, out there. You see a lot of uh, people speaking about it, leak drafts and all those dynamics. I think it's important also to uh, bear this in mind. Uh, last week, I know I, that it, yeah. we have lost him again. Yes, I think so. We have some connection problems. Okay, yeah. Johan. I'll pause Sorry here, Alejandra. Um, I'm not sure whether it was on my okay. side. Okay. Yeah. Go on. No, I'll, I'll give the floor back to you also to uh, give the others uh, Thank the you. opportunity to comment. Was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. So now we go with, uh, with Davis. David. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about the um, Section 230 of the CDA uh, in the USA and the relationship between this um, this regulation and the the online harm bills in UK. Um, how do you think uh, this is related? And how do you think this is related with uh, the the DSA? And uh, how th does these regulations effectively put a stop to the forced uh, to the for for the liability platforms of liability, how do you combine them? Thank you. We cannot hear you. There you go. I've unmuted myself. We're all committing the classic uh, online faux pas today. Um, apologies. That, that's a really interesting question because Section Two Thirty and the liability regime goes to the heart of a lot of questions about platform responsibility, particularly within the DSA. Um, and of course, we know in the US that there is now a big debate about the appropriateness of Section 230, although that may have changed now with the, the new administration. And, and, and the US has certainly in the past, in trade agreements, attempted to 
insert provisions around platform liability in, into those agreements. Um, now, I, free trade agreements are slightly beyond our uh, our remit today, but um, it, it is a really interesting question. And, and I, I, I do think, though, that Section 230 has um, had a significant impact in the drafting of the DSA, as I, as I said earlier, I think I think there are some there are some questions about Article Six and whether or not that certain hosts could sort of falsely claim to be eligible for immunity, i.e., that they are passive when in fact they're active. And I I do think that it's a missed opportunity at the moment not to to be more clear to clarify what an active platform is and in our view that is a platform that optimizes content you know we, we recognize that as a broadcaster that optimizes content every day because we exercise editorial judgment well you know a, a lot of the platforms are exercising judgment based on algorithms but they're nevertheless optimizing content and we find it hard to understand how they could be considered to be to be passive at all and i think that it would bring a lot of clarity to this argument and to the dsa if that was defined more clearly. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've got to stop pretending that the way in which content is optimized and indeed optimized against advertising um, is in any way acting in the spirit of the passive platforms that the um, original e-commerce directive um, sets out. So uh, I, I would hope that that is something that will get clarified um, as, the, as the DSA passes through the legislative process. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, yes, that's the key, the, one of the key issues, uh, liability, platform liability, and we will work in, in it. Um, so, Carlos, I think he, you wanted to react on the, on, the, on the consistency between legislative files that um, we have addressed before. Uh, Alejandra, thank you. Just, thank you. just to mention one one big dossier that has not been referenced so far, which is the GDPR, and um, to point to, um, to the prohibition on Article 5 to combine uh, personal data that online gatekeepers may be obtaining when providing core platform services with uh, other personal data that they may be uh, getting through third parties or, uh, or when providing different, different services. And, um, and I think it's a core issue because of uh, the model that this company has been very uh, successfully developing um, with this possibility of accessing enormous amounts of data uh, and uh, processing it and extract insights and then uh, create profiles and, and sell it for online advertisement purposes mainly. But, uh, but it's been very successful in allowing them to move from certain digital services into adjacent or ancillary markets. And I see uh, that this prohibition has uh, a caveat, which is the, uh, the consent of the end user um, in line with the provisions of the GDPR. So I, I, I don't claim to, um, to have, a, a, let's say, a, a solution in terms of how this should, um, should be a feature in the final version of the DMA. But I would like to point it out as an opportunity uh, for the DMA to complement somehow the GDPR and make sure that that uh, consent from the end user is, uh, is meaningful, effective, and, and provided in a user-friendly way. Because um, we always have this uh, constant problem of, um, of uh, whether the consent that we um, that we provide to um, to engage with some of these services is really a uh, you know a meaningful concept that is provided with full liberty or whether is um, is perhaps not uh, not so uh, not, not such a free option for the for the end user so just to just to make that point and, and I would of course welcome the remarks of others on, on this aspect thank you Carlos yes it is we have a question for you um, so this uh, regarding that the, um, do you think that the DMA and DSA can contribute to the political objective of achieving dig uh, digital sovereignty in Europe? Well, that's uh, that's an easy one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so um, well, perhaps one, one point that uh, that you made, Alejandra, in the beginning, uh, and. and that is uh, that this is not uh, a European crusade against uh, big tech uh, right. or, or uh, you know um, companies coming from from the US or, or China I think that uh, uh, the concerns about uh, fairness contestability uh, trust uh, 
uh, spread in a number of jurisdictions outside of the EU. So, uh, so this not should, be, uh, should not be understood as a as a fight uh, um, from the EU on on American companies. But um, but what is clear is that um, through these legislative actions, we think that we can create an environment that will uh, foster innovation, that will dynamize the markets, and this will bring opportunities for European and non-European companies. If if you understand, I guess digital sovereignty as uh, developing technical capabilities in Europe to reduce your dependency from, from the US or China or certain or certain technological domains, what you need perhaps is to make sure that these provisions are aligned with the with the industrial policy vision that the Commission is putting forward and um, and also with uh, developments on competition policy and on sectoral regulation. If I think for instance about the situation in particular for, for telco operators with connectivity um, we have in the digital compass these very ambitious objectives and targets of uh, having gigabit connectivity and, and 5G for all populated areas in 2030. Um, but at the same time, we have actions on the competition policy side, be it um, through state aid provisions, be it through uh, uh, the view of mergers and consolidation in the market, be it through uh, the views on cooperation between players in the market, and, and some dispositions of sectoral regulation that continue a role in, let's say, the revenue base of the operator and the capability to invest in the networks. Um, perhaps the, the problem for the digital sovereignty in Europe is, is that we need alignment between the, the vision and the ambition and, and the different domains, policy and regulatory domains that can lead, can lead us there. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Now, now we have a, a question uh, from the floor. Um, I think uh, whoever wants to, to answer it. Um, so it is, um, I am interested in the panel's views on whether and how DMA and DSA be integrated more closely. One way could be to ensure their aim are aligned for at least not, conf not conflicted. Another is consi consistent definitions. Um, so any, uh, do you have any other idea how DMA and DSA could be integrated more closely any of you have any ideas of what could we propose to the Commission, to the to the Council and the Parliament as well? Can I ask the question? I mean, I, yeah. the question to the questioner is to, to what end? I mean, and, and again, I'm sort of bringing some experience as a as a as a broadcaster and a telco. We don't try to get the telecoms framework and ADMSD aligned. We don't create the same definitions. We're dealing with two different things here. I'm, I'm not convinced that alignment as described by the question makes a lot of sense, but I, I, I defer to the regulators who may have their own views on, on this, but as a business, that wouldn't make much sense to me. And, and just to build on, on that point, I think at a very minimum, they shouldn't be contradictory. Um, so I, I fully agree that they don't necessarily need to be the same, uh, that they there may be different challenges which require better and different tailoring is something I've talked about. But what is clear is they should not be contradictory and self-defeating. Uh, and so I want to highlight again the point about fraud that I made. We should not see a provision in the Digital Markets Act, which preferentially is defeating to the objective in the Digital Services Act of making online services safer and more trusted. They should be pushing in the same direction, even if they don't do the same thing. No, I, I guess uh, I agree also on the fact that uh, the idea is that they should be aligned does not make sense for me. Uh, both texts have different aim, uh, which is legitimate, just like GDPR has uh, another aim, protecting privacy. Uh, we just need to really understand the, the articulation between both. Uh, and uh, it's nothing new. Uh, I guess uh, typically we have learned in telecommunication uh, uh, big telcos uh, have learned to work with several regulators at the same time, but on different issues, with competition regulation, where they were airing on the wrong side of the competition law, or dealing with the GDPR regulators, or dealing with telco regulator, or in France, dealing with the media regulator when they were distributing media services. So there's nothing new. Just We just need clarity. And yeah, so we will need some more work to clearly understand how the DSA and the DMA interact together, or also how the DSA interact with the AVMS directive, as mentioned earlier. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to 
Okay. Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's uh, both, both regulation have different different scopes, different point of view, and uh, I mean they should be maintained as they are, even though we may. Uh, improve them with all the ideas that you have posed in, during all your presentations. So um, now we we are in the end. Uh, I would like to thank you very very much to all of you uh, for all for sharing with us all the ideas from the regulator points of view and from the industry. And uh, I would like uh, to to thank uh, the the ICC and Berek of course for organizing this interesting debate and both regulation which is not very easy and we have you have proved to be great on doing that so thank you thank you very much and we'll keep in contact